And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. Good evening. And who... Oh boy, have we... It has been... It has been... We are about halfway done with the classes in Veil of the Void. But we... But this also means that we're going to be delving headfirst into the... Into the casters for the next few weeks. Well, we've already done a couple casters, and there are only a few more. So for those of you who liked our two fort jokes... I think that I think that's coming to an end. I'll find something, you'll see. Oh, I'm sure that I'm sure that you will. It's just that that form of the, that form of them is not is not is not going to be coming around anytime soon. Mhm. Mm However, that uh, but for th but for this week, well, let's talk about druids. Druid. We are to we are once again talking about the mystery of the druids. It's a damn mystery that plagues us, monk. Apparently, we can't ever get rid of it or solve it. All the druids have an attitude. Is that why they're rude? <laughs> But the thing now we've we've had some in, we've had some infamous moments when it comes to the when it comes to the idea of a druid class in the past. I'd say a good chunk of it is due to the fact that the dru that the druid class um, is is infamous for being a little op in. Most of its popular appearances, mm -hmm. I would agree. Uh, now one w one would think, if one would think, what about the druid in Thirteenth Age? Honestly, the druid in Thirteenth Age isn't too terrible. It's just, it's just a little bit long, because it, because it's like three or three or four different cl different um, classes all at once. It and that's. I think that's kind of one of the issues with how the druid tends to manifest. It co it covers many different uh, many different hats, and it does them all really well. You have shape shifting. Sometimes you have the animal companion thing. You have the nature casting thing. Some and that nature casting can be all can be all over the place too. Sometimes it could be the healer. Sometimes it could be the don't fuck with mother nature thing. And sometimes it can just be the guy who has a wooden stick in his hand, casts some magic on that wooden stick to make it more sturdy, and clubs you over the fucking head. Ah, shillelagh. One of my favorite spells, because nobody knows how to pronounce it. At least they didn't used to. Yeah. That's the, that's the reason why um, Godzilla has been a thing for so long. 5e doesn't quite have that problem. That's why we, we've moved it to Cowzilla since the Warlock took that particular spot, though the Cleric is still just as fucking broken. Mm -hmm. And in other places where we've seen the Druid implemented, uh, even in, in Heavens and Heresies, there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a niche that it fills very, very well, and it can be very, very powerful, although Heavens and Heresies does that with every class. So much like the... Uh, the uh, tagline for the Brawl Minus hack says, when everyone is broken, no one is. <laughs> I love that one. And then they moved it to the Borker the Better. Yeah. Which is certainly true, but do but doesn't sound as nice. Doesn't roll off the tongue <laughs> quite right. I think, I think they got rid of the first one because they realized it was implying that they were uh, agreeing with a villain. Syndrome. <laughs> Even though he wasn't the first person to say that, 
I know. in the movie. I know. And, well, som- sometimes the best kind of villain is the one that's the hero of their own story, and som- sometimes, the- sometimes even though the villain is going about it the wrong way, they may have some points. True. But, uh... The whole the whole thing with druids being this overpowered thing is because they can fill so many roles usually and do it as good as or better than classes dedicated to those roles. The ultimately the ultimately the problem is is one that one that's inherent to class-based systems. When mm. you have a class-based system, there's the implication that each individual character within that system is going is meant to specialize or spe- in one thing or one general area and the the key thing is when all is when all those moving parts come together much much in the same way that you have di- that you have di- that if you're you have different roles in a in a um, squad based video game you know like what battlefield used to be but i digress <laughs> However, when you're doing that, any sort of archetype that could be considered a jack of all trades is going to go one of two ways. They're either going to suck all of the ass or they're going to kick all of the ass. You're either a jack of all trades and master of none or a jack of all trades and a master of all. The former is things is things like is things like well, bards until 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 about a, until about twenty years ago, even that even then, and rangers even up till even up till now, because of the because of the fact that they dip into a bunch of different things, but because of that, they don't have anything that's going to, that that you can really call upon them to use. They're a glorified pocket pick. Yep, and then of course. I can already hear it in the distance, monk. But bards are diplomancers, which is why he mentioned about 20 years ago, because it's been about 20 years since bards really started shining as diplomancers in 3 and 3.5. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the other screams I'm hearing, but rogues are jacks of all trade, too. No, they're specialized at one thing, being the skill monkey. The skill, the skill monkey and the indirect fighter is the purview of rogues. Yeah. And because and because of the, and that's something that other people might dip into but they're but the rogue is going to do it better. With druids with druids however, are it's funny that I brought up 13th age earlier because the way that they did it is you can is kind of kind of a um tr- it seems like a track system like what we do at f- at first mm-hmm. but in all honesty it has more it has more dna with the with the bit with the um cl- with the um class focus setup that is se- that is seen in um double cr- double cross as mm-hmm. well as well as as well as got as well as god hunters yeah the idea being you can either you can you can either t- you can either be an initiate in three different avenues of the druid, or be an adept in one and, and an initiate in one other. Yep, which means you either make yourself useful in multiple small ways, mm-hmm. or make yourself really useful in one way, and then sort of useful in another. And even even within that, the the three, um, the three, one, the, the, uh, there were, there's only three of them, but there's four, there were four different types that you could, that you could dip into as yeah. a, as a druid. Yeah. Because, and because of that, you're go, you were going to have, you're going to have to, t- you're not going to be able to get everything. You'd be take, you would be taking some disadvantage. Not so much taking a disadvantage, I'd say it's more that you're leaving an option behind. Mm-hmm. 
it's not a disadvantage because it's not like you're losing something already intrinsic to you. You're just not choosing something. A little bit, little bit different in context, I think. Yeah, if you'll give if you'll give me a moment, let me di let me dig up my copy of Thirteen True Ways, so I can be so I can better illustrate this. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I can I know some people might say they only put it in Thirteen True Ways to to make more money. No, they um. If the, if they were to put it in if they were to put it in the core book it wouldn't it would have had issues wouldn't have fit well though, well also they probably would they probably would have they probably would have had to make even make even more pages and every page costs money mm -hmm. but let's see archmage index so Cla classes classes and. The funny thing is, as as you saw when we did the ranked look at D and D fourth edition classes, the um the dru a lot of the stuff that was categorized as the druid in the past was split. Mm -hmm. But yeah, with the druid, and I I have to I have to slightly correct myself. There are um I have a total of five. Avenues that the dru that the druid can go into. You have the animal companion. You have the elemental caster. You have the shifter, which is a way to give them their own flexible attacks. Actually, no, the ship the shifter was wasn't that. That was just their version of poly of um of druidic shape changing. The terrain caster, the warrior druid, which is where they're going to get their flexible attacks, and the wild healer. Mm -hmm. And each of those you e you either pick you could either be an initiate or an ad or an adept like I mentioned beforehand. So you pick out of the five of these, you pick three if you want all three to be initiates, or you pick two and you pick one of them to be adept in. Mm -hmm. It's there. It's their spin on the whole three talents thing that every class had in Thirteenth Age. But because of that, yes, there's a wide amount of stuff that you can do as druids. In ke in keeping with the wide amount of stuff you can do with classes in Thirteenth Age, but it's not a do everything issue. Now, the idea of that's the idea of nature casting ends up lending its. The reason why we've been talking about the druid is that this week's class, the naturalist, leans into um, aspects of the of the druid just from just from the opening appearances. And the whole using fo using forest magic, and which, as an aside, that's another thing that's kind of annoyed me when it comes to the portrayal of druids. It's all much like with rangers; it's always one particular type of environment. It's supposed to be envir they're supposed to be environmental masters, but we only ever see them in one kind of environment. The green places. Yeah, which is why I actually like the character art at the top of Naturalist, where the long blurb is. It's, it's, it's uh, one of the prototypes. It's a prototype naturalist. And if you remember the prototy prototypes, everybody, that species is a species of living machines. Sure, it's covered with some greenery because, again, the stereotypical imagery. Mm -hmm. But it's a good way to juxtapose what is stereotypical with something to uh, counter it. And even the end of uh, chapter art looks like a prototype. It could, it could be. All that metal in its face. Mm -hmm. But it, but anyway, it opens up by saying, the art of the naturalist is so rare that many believe they don't exist. Those that follow this path tend to seclude themselves away from crowds and close to nature. They are rarely s seen as fond of people as they are of nature. When they are seen, they are said to be incredible at what they do. They use the magic of the forest to cause devastating effects. Flora and fauna alike respond and assist them. Reports of giant tree men and animals appearing to crush those who had harmed their world have been recalled by survivors and onlookers. It is said that they are even capable of transforming into an avatar of life or death themselves. Naturalists are defenders of their world and beliefs. They fight with all the unbridled rage of nature. Those that anger nature best be ready to fight, for the naturalists do not forgive easily. 
I think one dis one issue that could potentially happen is how is how the hell do you talk a naturalist into into being off planet when it comes when it comes to a setting like this that's all about interstellarness. Um I think that we'll find out, won't we? Mm-hmm. So they are proficient in archaic weapons, staves, and wands, light armor, and cloaks. And we're talking about the cloaks you wear, people, not the things that turn you invisible. Mm -hmm. when, and upon lev upon leveling up, you add either 1d6 or 3 plus vitality to your max HP. So... With starting items, you ha you. This is the, this is one of this is one of the rare cases where the starting kit where the starting kit doesn't have picks. Yep, no choices. Mm -hmm. You start with two archaic weapons, a cloak of natura, synthetic light armor, forty six times a thousand system credits, the unique language of Sylve Natura, the language of the wilds, and one bonus level in our canting. Yep. And looking at it should be known that you're gonna be getting an extra spell every even level. So Yep, so ten extra spells there. Mm hmm So we start off with level one abilities. First is Arcanting, which of course is exclusive. Your primary arcane casting vir virtue is judgment. You gain access to the unique spell tree of Natura. You know five novice spells at character creation and two spells from the mystic spell tree. Five novice spells, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Chosen of Life, also exclusive. Three times per long rest after successfully casting a Natura spell, your companion animal may leap to a target within seven squares of you and heal them for your judgment in HP. It may instead target an adversary in range, inflicting your judgment in natural damage and grasping the target for two rounds. Mm. And then we have Companion Animal. You have always had an animal spirit with you. What this spirit is or looks like is up to you, with a few limitations. It must be small-sized, for example, a small cat or bird. It cannot attack, but can perform simple actions. It has 10 plus vitality, max HP. If it is killed, it may be respawned in one hour. Respawning animal companion. Mm -hmm. And we have the Tome of Natura Arcanica, also exclusive. There are several passages that may be read to cause the listed effect to appear. Each time a passage is read, there is a four-round cooldown until the next passage may be read. As you travel the universe, you may be able to find powerful new passages. As you level up, the spell effects may change at levels 1, 5, 10, 15, and 20. There's your, uh, there's your reason for going around the universe, Monk. Fair enough. You go around the music to find more, more of your craft. That's a bit of a bard. That's a bit of a bardish thing, honestly. Well, think about it though. Actually, kind of from a from a logical standpoint, they learn all their na their nature magic from the world they they live on. But every world is going to have a different nature soul, I guess is the best way to put it. So different spells from different natural souls. A fair a fair point. So. Passage 1, I am, I am kin of the wild, as they are mine, we stand as one. As you speak these words, you mark a square adjacent to you. You may summon one average beast on the marked square. At level 10, you may summon two average beasts or one strong beast. The summoned units last until killed or dismissed or eight hours, whichever happens first. This passage may only be used once every long rest. Beasts summoned this way have half their max HP. Having That's it, still really powerful. Read, having it that you're reading off from a tome just gives me that just gives me this idea of a of a combination of a druid and a evangelist. <laughs> well, the original uh, or, or up in the uh, the large storytelling portion for the for the naturalist, 
uh, it's it, it even says, uh, as Phelan spoke the phrase he's written on his hand and heart, because he's a metal man, so he carved it into his skin. Mm-hmm. Your tome doesn't have to be a book, monk. No, but the idea the idea of a the idea of a druidic version of a black preacher amuses me. I uh, uh what amuses me is a is a a druidic version of Scar. Just tattooing each each and every phrase on his skin. Fair point. <laughs> Passage two: The mists of Andoreth shall swallow the wicked and hide the innocent. As you speak these words, a mist flows out in a seven by seven radius around you. All allies in the mist must add one auto hit to covert check. Sorry, no, there's no must part. Oh, adversaries attempting to attack another ally within this have one auto miss die. This effect lasts for two rounds. Then going up by one for each t for each um, tier from cast. Once the effect ends, it cannot be cast for another three rounds. You may cancel the mist early. If you do, it cannot be used for another four rounds. Why would you cancel it early? Mm -hmm. Allies all get auto hits on covert checks. That's just useful, and adversaries automatically miss. Mm -hmm. Passage 3. Wolves hunt in packs at the pack leader's command. I am that leader. Your words echo like a wolf's howl. Target an adversary and two wolf knights around the target. Perform a single attack using your arcanting virtue. On a successful hit, inflict 2, 3, 4, 5, or 8d6 plus judgment slashing damage. What's this? I'm getting Chaos Legion flashbacks again. I mean, a little bit. As well as the Bell of Ashes. You mean the the, the Soul Summoning Bell? Yep. Or Spirit Summoning Bell, I think it's mm -hmm. called. Yes, um, I could absolutely see this being um, uh, a strong... Actually, it's it kind of sounds like one of my ashes that I currently have. Though I'm going for the Mimic tier soon. Passage 4. The forests consume the foolish that linger within. As you speak these words, choose a spot within 15 squares of you. All, I'm assuming that spot is supposed to be a square. Actually, never mind. All adversaries within a 7x7 area field centered on that spot must perform a contested arcanting check. On failure, vines wrap around the target's legs, grasping them. They take 1, 2, 3, 4, or 6 d6 piercing damage as thorns grow from the vines. The vines last three rounds or until the entangled adversaries succeed the contested check. You may choose to channel the spell each phase. If you do, they will take another round of damage each time you channel it. <laughs> pa passage 5. I got this one, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I am the vessel of nature's fury and wrath. Your weapon is transformed into a tree staff, and your armor is now the difficulty level of medium armor. Your weapon deals an additional 1d6 acid damage, and you may use arcanting to perform attacks. This effect lasts until dismissed, or four rounds. May not be used in archetype form. Archetype form. <laughs> uh, when I hear tree staff, for whatever reason, I think of that big club that Genji had. That not Genji, but um, Ben K had in the Genji PS2 game. Yeah, a, a shillelagh. Mm -hmm. It's just a caber used as a shillelagh. That's all. Passage. All this is is a really strong shillelagh spell. That's mm -hmm. all. And and iron and iron bark armor. Yeah. Passage 6. The Wrath of the Treekin is always ready. Summon a great treekin adjacent to you that attacks two targets of your choice within 15 squares. The attack uses your arcanting virtue to attack plus one auto hit die. On a successful hit, it inflicts 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7 d6 force damage. On a failure, the tree lashes out in a fury and branches fly off in a 5x5 radius around it. 
All beings within the field must make a contested or canting check or be hit by the branches. You automatically pass. On a failure, they take your player level in piercing damage. So, successful, you do lots of damage. Miss, you still do some damage. That's... <laughs> but... I don't think it I don't think it's I don't think it says anywhere how many um how many pa how many pages you start with Um I think you just start with these 6 Mhm mm but still you get si you get 6 different abilities and you're getting seven and you're getting 7 spells Yep, five Natura and two Mystic. Mm -hmm. Well, five Novice level. You could take just one Natura and then take some stuff from, I don't know, Aether, because I'm still loving the Mechromancer. <laughs> oh. But, uh... See, then you... Lastly, for level one, we have Feral Strike. Whenever you roll two of a kind or... Th of three or four results during a successful attack, you may inflict a feral strike. Add your vitality virtue to the attack's damage. So if you roll a pair of threes or a pair of fours on a successful attack, you get to add your vitality virtue to the attack's damage as well. That's... That's fantastic. I love it. Mm -hmm. So then we get to second level. Aside from an extra skill point, you also gain Nature's Shroud. Which is not exclusive. Mm -hmm. While within shadows and nature, you are automatically hidden from prying eyes, considered in covert with four successes. When in covert, you gain the ability Nature's Hidden Fury. On your next attack, you will deal plus judgment in damage and grasp the target for two rounds. Whether the attack is successful or not, you are revealed. They get a fucking sneak attack out at, at level two. Yep. That's <laughs> that's just one of those situations you go. Wait, what? And within sh within shadows and nature. Yeah. Why? Why? Why my druid have sneak attack? <laughs> I love it. Oh. Uh. At level 3, you gain Natural Healing. You and all allies around you heal naturally while not in combat. Twice per short rest, out of combat, all party members heal 15 plus Judgment in HP. And again, that's another non-exclusive, so... At level 4, you gain Advancement Training. At level 5, you gain Spell Upgrade. You may, which is exclusive, you may cast your spells at Apprentice level and gain two additional spells. So on top of the plus one spell you've been getting at two and four, and the five spells you start with, count it, guys, you're now at nine. Mm -hmm. nine, well, nine additional Natura spells. Yeah. You also, gains your, you also gain the first ability in your specialization. At level six, you gain Mystic Connection. Once per long rest, you may reduce your Natura and Arcane char um, charge states by 7. You also recharge these charge states during a short rest of 4 hours rather than a long rest, though you must spend the full time in focus. Bringing down casting charge states is nice. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me of something that Trevor pointed out on Twitter that I feel like I do need to mention just very briefly in in reference to the Mimic, when they use the spell that actually opens and pours Reflection, uh, m the Realm of Reflection's energy into the area that they're in, um, they don't build Reflection Charge anymore because now it counts as being in the Realm of Reflection. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the rules of magic from when we introduced them in the Mech Romancer, uh, if you're in the realm in which the actual arcane uh, connection comes from, uh, you build no charge state. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if they'll have a spell like that here. I'm mm -hmm. almost sure they will. Mm -hmm. At 7th level, you gain Advancement Training. At 8th level, you gain Charming Nature. Gain one bonus level in Speechcraft. 
when you reach level 10, you may use your judgment instead of char instead of the charm mentality virtues when performing the check. At level 9, you gain Traverse the Natural Roots. You may travel the roots of the Mother Tree. Choose an area within 2 times max movement and teleport to that spot. Procs on RS if adjacent to an adversary. Procs and RS. Procs uh, and a R reactionary strike. Yeah, the A and O from a distance is, is easy to miss. Oh. Yeah, I understand. If you pass through an adversary's adjacent area, they do not get an RS. Um, six round cooldown. Yeah. So basically, you get to teleport two times max movement once every six rounds, and so long as you don't land directly adjacent to a uh, to an enemy, no one gets to hit you with an AOO or the equivalent thereof. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's just that's I like that. That's nice. At level 10, you gain the next ability in your specialization. You also gain spell upgrade, so you can now cast spells at adept level and gain two additional spells. And you got one more additional spell because it's level 10. Mm -hmm. Hold on, hold on. Let's let's do let's do some more math. We were at uh, nine natura spells at level five. At level six, you would have been at ten natura spells. At level eight, you would have been at eleven natura spells. And then you get three more at level 10. So you're at 14 natura spells, everybody. It's going to be the spelliest spellcaster that ever did spell. Mm -hmm. At this system. <laughs> level at 11, you gain advancement training. At 12, you gain wings of natura. You can activate the wings of natura essence as an extra action. While activated, you have a flight speed of 10 squares. This lasts for five rounds with a three-round cooldown. At level 13, that go ahead. Wings of natura is not unique either. Mm-hmm. At level 13, you gain Entangled Arcanting. Once every Which five, is exclusive. Yep, once every five rounds. When an adversary casts a spell, you may perform a contested Arcanting check with plus one auto hit. If you succeed, you cancel their spell, root them until the end of your next turn, and inflict 15 piercing damage. Once every five rounds, you can just counter spell with damage and bind? What the fuck?! <laughs> it, has, it even has an auto hit die what is this shit I was waiting for a what the fuck moment it did not disappoint what the fuck and auto hit die on, on the check on the contested check one auto hit first of all second of all bind damage and, can't, and, and cancel their spell just yeah, sure, it's every five rounds, but that's every five rounds that you're fucking over a spellcaster's day. I think I told you about the um about the uh, the infamous stunt that I would pull with trap cards when I'd st when I was still playing Yu-Gi-Oh. Yes. Wait until Isn't someone it? breaks out their ace card, then trap hole. Down it goes. <laughs> It was even worse on the Gravekeeper deck because what? Because down it goes, and unle unless you get rid of that field, which already has Magic Reflector on it, nothing's going out. Unless it's my stuff. <laughs> yep. Um, anyway, thir at 13th level, you... Wait, we already, we already went with that. At 14th level, you gain Advancement Training. At 15th level, you gain the next ability in your Specialization. And you gain spell upgrades, so you can now cast spells at Magus level and gain one additional spell. And if you're keeping track again, we are at 14 spells back at level 10. We've got two more plus ones at 12 and 14, and one additional here at 15. So it's another three spells of 17 Natura spells. Or any other tree that you choose of. Mm-hmm. At, six, at level 16, you gain Powerful Summons. Your summon creatures have plus 20% max HP. Their attacks may use your Arcanting skill instead of their primary virtue. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That's actually really nice. Now instead of starting at 50%, they start at 70% HP. Yep. And it's, they use your Arcanting for attacks. That's nice. Mm -hmm. um, obviously this is exclusive since... Summons are exclusive to the naturalist. Yep. 
At 17, you gain Advancement Training. At 18, you gain Passage Revisions. And I'd like to... I'd like to mention here that the passages were originally mentioned as changing at uh, 1, 5, 10, 15, and 20. Um, 5, 10, 15, and 20 are all specialist levels, and I'm guessing that's where the other revisions we're going to see are. Mm -hmm. But for passage 1, the summoned creature now lasts permanently rather than 8 hours. For passage 2... The radius is now 11 by 11. For passage 3, the attack rolls with 2 auto-hit. For passage 4, you no longer need to channel this spell. It deals the damage each round regardless. For passage 5, your armor level is heavy while this is active. For passage 6, the Great Tree can explode at the end of its attack now, regardless whether it hits or misses. Allies no, lo no longer need to roll to dodge the attack. So your summoned creature lasts until you kill or dispel it. Uh, what? The radius of of your of your mist is now eleven by eleven. The attack with the wolf guards is made with two auto hit dice. The thorns now do damage whether you chan it, channel or not, which means they still bind. Um, your armor is now considered heavy when you do uber shillelagh. As I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the tree can blows up and there's no friendly fire, no matter what. That's a pretty... That's level 18. What's the fucking capstone? Well, let's get to that. At 19, and this is a non-exclusive, you gain friend to flora and fauna. All beasts and tree kin pre creatures consider you friendly and will refrain from attacking you. However, they will attack if threatened or attacked. And I mean, at, go ahead. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty druid. And at level twenty, you gain spell mastery, so you gain access to you to your superlative spells. You yes. gain your final, re, you gain your final abilities with specializations, and you gain your ultimate, life's chosen. You have bloomed t into a full fledged guardian of life. Add a permanent plus one to your judgment. This may bring you above nine. Your passages have a cooldown of two rounds instead of four. Passage five is now a permanent duration. Holy fuck! Uber shillelagh permanent? What? That's an uber shillelagh plus 1d6 acid damage, arcanting to perform attacks, heavy, heavy armor... And the effect lasts until dismissed at that point. Mm -hmm. It's it's permanent unless you dismiss it. Why the fuck would you ever dismiss it? You just passage 5 at level 20 and just go! <laughs> yeah, just go! God, now now I'm excited. I'm excited, Monk. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm really excited. So then we get to the sub then we get to the subclasses. Now, my, my question here, since I don't see, I'm not seeing any of those, oh, I am seeing them, hold on, never mind. I saw one, at least. And I'm not, the f I'm not sure how these could apply if you, you, if you decided to swap them out. You're wondering whether the, whether these are supposed to be um, exclusive all, or not. All of these are supposed to be exclusive or not, but I don't think so. And the first, the archetype has, um, has has branches within it. Uh, I I want to I want to read this opening because it, it it needs it needs the gravitas. I'm sorry, monk. <clears throat> While focusing upon the realm of Adareth, you have a vision. A book of life appears in front of you, held by a massive tree. Several words appear on this paper, and an overwhelming power enters you. You understand your path now. You may enter a form known only as the Archetype. While in this form, one of the Prime Eternals, 
either life or death transforms you into their avatar. So, we have the first we have the Prime's archetype. During the action phase, you may read the words in the tome and transform yourself into an avatar of the Prime of your choice. While transformed, you cannot use any of the tome abilities. You may, you may maintain the archetype form for up to seven rounds. Each archetype and its effects are stated below five-round cooldown. Um, and as far as which at and certain bad designers might have it that you have to pick one either life or death, and that's the one you're stuck with. The way this is written, you could go either way. The way this is written, every time you cast this, you can choose a different archetype. Mm -hmm. You can either choose Elenath or Ruinath. The yep. two archetypes of life and death. Mm -hmm. The El Elenath. The arcane of the wilds flood over you. Leaves and branches swirl around you. As you open your eyes, the wilds quiet as you transform into a new form of life. You are wrapped in a natural armor crafted from leaves, bark, and vines of the mother tree. Your weapons are replaced by a copy of life's great staff, of great staff, Espirit. You and your allies are instantly healed for player for player for plus player level in HP. While in this form, you cannot use melee attacks. Below is a is listed the stats of your weapon, armor, abilities, and attacks. So, a spirit, finesse, and arcanting, range 12, 24, 2, 3, 4, or 5, d6, natura, and pure damage. And on a successful hit, heal an ally within four squares of the target by your judgment. So you shoot them with the staff, do pure damage, and then heal and heal somebody. Mm -hmm. Why am I getting... Monk, I have the strangest sense of Dijon mustard <laughs> from this book! Mm -hmm. The flo Next you have the Florana armor, which is light armor. Add one auto-hit die to an arcanting roll once every three rounds... Range damage against you is reduced by 3, 5, 7, and ten, or 10. Minimum of 1 damage. Mm. And we have Treekin Siege. As an action, perform a hard 4 arcanting check. If you succeed, 3 defenders appear beside you and attack up to 3 adversaries of your choice. Each adversary may perform a challenging 6 dodge check. On a failure, they take 1... Not one, two, three, four, or five d6 damage per boulder. I think that's a uh, a holdover. He may need to change that. Mm -hmm. Oh, on a success, they take half damage, and this has a three round cooldown. So you can treat and siege once every three three rounds, and you can just shoot. Magic-y magic every round. It only lasts five rounds, though, so you can only really effectively tree can siege twice if you tree can siege on your first turn. Early on, at or, the very least. Yeah, any time before turn three. Mm -hmm. Then we have Archetype of Ruinath. Reach into a small tear and pull out a replica of Cessation, Death's Scythe, which takes the place of your weapon. As you draw from the power of the veil, armor replaces your own, and the cloak of death conceals your face. You cannot cast spells in this form. However, your power is temporarily raised by 2, 3, 4, or 5. So, th this, is, this is literally just death's death form from Darksiders 2. Yep. So... Cessation uses our canting and power. Deals 2, 3, 4, or 6 d6 plus, po plus power. If you roll 3 threes or 4s on a successful attack, inflict a critical plus 1. What? Okay! <laughs> then we have Death's Cloak, which is medium armor. You may add one auto-hit die to your attacks every three rounds. Melee damage against you is reduced by 5, 9, 15, or 20, one damage minimum. Okay. And, and last we have Rending Slash. 
as a hard four attack action, perform a sweeping scythe attack in a four square cone in front of you. On success, inflict cessation's damage and fear. Four round cooldown. I'm going to hurt you all, and then you're all going to be very, very scared because I'm going to take your souls. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, this is this is what you get for getting to this arc to this specialization. Reminding you now, people, this is the level five abilities, and they scale. Speaking of that, then we get to level ten paradigm shift. While not in the archetype form, you may switch between life and death every three rounds. Gain, ben gain benefits depending on which archetype you are following. If it's life, spells gain an auto-hit die when casting, and if it's death, attacks gain an auto-hit die. You get to choose every three rounds whether you're going to be a blaster caster or a fuck you, I'm going to hit you mage. You either shoot or cast fist, and you get... F what? <laughs> If at, this is this good, what about the other two? At level 15, you gain Archetype's Gift. You gain unique abilities that may each be used once per 24-hour period. If it's, if it's that long of a cooldown, I'm scared. Oh, God. So, claim soul. The great harvester of souls, Ruinath, has blessed you with the ability to reap a soul from the battlefield instantly. Once per, str once per short rest, choose an average or strong adversary. If that adversary has less than equ less than or equal to 30 or 60% max HP, it is instantly killed and its soul dragged to the ether realm. You learn any important knowledge that being may have been withholding. Now, I would like to note that those that those places where where we said average or strong 30 or 60, that's the scaling. Mm -hmm. So, at level 15, an average adversary at 30% or less max HP, you can then just kill it, take all its info. Mm -hmm. At level 20, when you get the final level of specialization, it's a strong adversary at 60% or less max HP, and kill it and take its info. Yep. Oh my god. Alternatively, you have Blessed Life. You inst instantly heal three allies up to half their max HP, remove all detrimental effects, grant a buff that bestows a recharging energy shield of five HP and lasts for one hour. What? What? <laughs> so if they're already at half max HP, you've just put them back at full. Mm -hmm. And you've just removed all their debuffs. And now we get to its level 20 effect. Oh One God, soul. No. Your archetype forms now have a three-round cooldown. While attuned to life, gain an auto-hit die on speechcraft checks and a 15-square flight. While attuned to death, gain an auto-hit die on intimidation checks and inflict plus power in damage. Now it has out-of-combat shit?! <laughs> Also, I need to make a correction to what I said earlier about the, the armor and stuff. The ra the archetype form lasts up to seven rounds. Mm -hmm. the, the five round is the is the cooldown. So now it's a three round cooldown. So in seven rounds, those things that you can only that have a three round cooldown from their from their actual moves for the Treekin Siege, you mm -hmm. could do it you could do it uh three times if you started on turn one. Because you could do it first, fourth, and seventh. Yeah. Um and Whereas, now I'm, begin I'm beginning to understand why this is not why this is non-exclusive because everything that we said none of none of it really reflects on the on the um, naturalist on, on the yeah. naturalist which means this is something you don't you want to know what's you want to know would be terrifying I, I'm putting this on a necromancer yep a necromancer <laughs> with the death archetype I mean I mean no. No, you don't have to make it the death archetype, monk. Life archetype. Come on now. So many good spells. Or actually, you know, actually now they think about the death archetype would be would be far more interesting with a um field knight <laughs> or a combat medic. Yeah. 
oh shit so much more damage and now your combat medic's like i'm really taking the hp from you now <laughs> oh god mm -hmm. what the fuck so hey let's see what the, let, if, if that's that good what the fuck <laughs> what's next the contractor which is an exclusive which is exclusive mm-hmm Prime beasts are great and powerful creatures that have existed since the dawn of life's creation. The contractor forms agreements of servitude with these prime beasts that grant them special enchantments, allowing the contractor to summon an avatar of the beasts. So, for any of those who wanted who wanted to be who wanted to be Sheena from Tales of Symphonia or any summoner in FF, here you go, or any summoner in Tales. Or any summoner. Mm -hmm. So, you, we have the primal contract. During a long rest of at least six hours, you may form a contract with a new prime beast. You must spend six hours meditating within a place connected to the realm of Adareth. For example, a park, an oxygen field, a chamber of life, etc. Once summoned, the creature stays active until dismissed or killed. If a summoned unit is killed, it cannot be summoned until your next short rest. That means that that means that you could just continue to summon them in a cycle. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> All right. So um, first we have the Everchange Shifters. The realm of Everchange is best reflected in the beasts it spews forth. The shifters constantly change their outward appearance and love using their power to drive mor mortals' hands. They are not evil beings. Rather, they are fulfilling Sylvanas' plans. What is... Uh, is the ever change yet another realm? Or is this just a carryover of the realm of reflection? Or what? I want to know. We'll probably, get in, we'll probably get into that later. Probably. But Trevor will tell me before we get there. So, mm -hmm. you know. Right, Trevor? <laughs> so let's see. Power 4, Finesse 4, Vital Vitality 5, Mentality 5, Judgment 5, and, Char and Charisma 8. Their types are Alien, Everchange, Humanoid, Average. Mm -hmm. Medium Armor, 70 HP, 5 Movement. Attacks use Copy Attack ability below. 2 Defense, 4 Intimidation, 2 Observation, 4 Speechcraft. Copy attack. Shifters copy attacks adversaries have. As their attack action, they copy a targeted adversary's weapon, including any buffs that come with it. Multi-attacks, sustain fire, other special effects. If they are in melee, they may use the target's melee or ranged weapon, if they have one. In order to use a ranged weapon, the shifter must be within 15 squares of the target. And I so you see a guy with a, with a rocket lawn chair, put the, uh, Put the ever change shifters right within his range, and then they have a rocket launcher too. Mm -hmm. Then identity theft. Shifters may take the form of any small or large sized humanoid being that they have observed for an hour or has been recently killed around them. If they take the form of a slain adversary, they can imitate the voice, memories, and predict the choices the creature would make. If observing for just an hour, they can only imitate the form and voice. So if you have them kill somebody, they get the memories and predict the types of choices that person would make. The Monk, you said I couldn't make any two fort jokes. It's the spy again. <laughs> you summon the fucking spy. Gentlemen, mm -hmm. it is time that I win once again. <laughs> And we have Messenger, the Ethereal Jacker. Ja Jackal. 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 Um, Messenger is the loyal beast of Ruinath. He is gifted with the ability to fade between the realm of Aether and Reaction, the central realm. Messenger is the is direct voice of Ruinath and never fails his missions. Anubis says what? I was going to say both Anubis and the... And and the gar the guardian in Onyx Equinox, although probably <laughs> nicer. <laughs> oh. Let's see. Type is beast, enscape, ethereal. P 
Power 5, Finesse 7, Vitality 5, Mentality 4, Judgment 4, Charisma 3, Medium Armor, 90 HP, Movement 10, 2 attacks, that being the Claw. The Claw? No, not the Claw, the Claw! Oh, yes, the Claw. And the Claw's damage scales for 2, 3, 4, or 5d6 damage plus 7. Mm -hmm. As Hunting 4, Observation 3, and Weapons 3. And two abilities. Ethereal Poison. Messenger's attacks are imbued with the leeching power of Enscape. On successful attacks, the target is knocked prone and takes 5, 10, 15, or 20 additional damage. May only affect the same target once every three rounds. And So he first slashes them for two... Like, just right now at level 5, when you first get him, he first slashes them up to twice, with Claws doing 2d6 plus 7 damage on successful hits. And then knocks them prone and does five additional damage. Mm -hmm. At least the first time he hits them. Yep. If they're prone, they're probably dead. Or they're going to get a Goodfellas-style welcome. Indeed. Then we have Ether Swap. As a movement action, Messenger may swap with you or an ally. If he does so, immediately swap positions. This swap does not proc RS strikes. If the swap target ends adjacent to any adversary, they may perform an attack. Three-round cooldown. Messenger so you just said... is a fucking displacer beast. Not, not only that, Monk, Monk, Monk. Like the, archetype, but like the Architect's teleport bot. What this is, is you send him up to somebody. And you have him ether swap. If you want somebody, like who needs to be right there, right then, perform a good attack. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, we have Paragon the Eternal Phoenix. Eternal Phoenix! <laughs> Paragon lives forever between life and death. This beast cannot die, nor does it truly live. Upon the end of its life cycle, it vanishes from the current realm, and a new form appears in a different realm. And if you listen close all the way out in Japan, you can hear somebody grabbing a, a flaming sword and going, Shh. <laughs> Paragon the Eternal Phoenix. Type is Beast, Arcane, and Ethereal. Um, power 4, Finesse 6, Vitality 4, Mentality 6, Judgment 5, and Charisma 4. Light Armor, 85 HP, Movement 8. Two Attacks... Either Flame Feathers, which which has a range of 15 or 30, and does 2, 3, 4, or 5d6, or Claws, which, do, which also do 2, 3, 4, or 5d6, Dodge 2, Flight 3, Hunting 3, Observation 2. First, Eternal Flame. Paragon inflicts 1, 2, 3, or 4d6 to adjacent adversaries at the start of his turn. So, he's fucking Teostra. Mm -hmm. Or anything else that has an armor of fire that does constant damage to you when you're next to it. Mm -hmm. Flame attack. Paragon can attack at range with flame feathers. If the attack hits, the next fire spell used against the target gains plus one bonus die. Ooh. Imagine... Ooh. Ooh, I could see a, a naturalist taking some fire spells from the arcane tree just to pair with this. Here's the question I have. Is that cumulative? Because he gets two fe flame feather attacks. That's a good idea. But I don't think it's going to be cumulative. Mm -hmm. Next is Rebirth. On reaching 0 HP, Paragon vanishes from this realm. All adjacent adversaries take 2, 3, 4, or 5d6 damage. He then reappears on the battlefield within eight squares of the contractor. He is healed to 25 HP. This may proc once per long rest. So he's the only one who has to die twice. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. When did this become Sekiro? <laughs> he's not a shadow. You're made of fire. You're the exact opposite. But that's okay. I love you anyway. Yeah. And flight. Paragon has a flight speed of 10, 15, 20, or 25 squares. All of that is at level 5. You summon one of these, it just follows you around for until it dies or you dismiss it. 
Mm-hmm. And I assume you'd only dismiss it before you'd summon a different one. Mm-hmm. And these guys scale! At 10th level, you gain Pledge of Protection. Your contracted summon absorbs half the damage you take. And Pledge of Destruction. While your contracted summon is active, both of you deal 20% pure damage in every third attack, plus 20% pure damage in every third attack. Let me correct myself. <laughs> what? Pl all the damage you just did, plus 20% pure damage of that. On top of it, every three every three rounds you, you every three times you attack. That means by round two, every one of these summons. Except for the ever change shifters. Well, no, because if if they're copying an attack that gives multi attacks, they get that too. And the but, other the other two have multi attack. Have, yeah, they have two each. Mm -hmm. So this means by by round two, your at the very least your contracted summon would have the ability to do the plus twenty percent pure damage. Jesus. And this applies to your own attacks as well. I know. At level 15, you gain Pledge of Rebirth. When a contracted creature dies, you may respawn them in 20 minutes instead of once per short rest. And at level 20, you gain Improved Contracts. All summoned units under your control gain plus one to their virtues. You gain access to Sophic and may make contracts with her. Sophic does not gain the plus one to her virtues. Sophic, the Elder Drokin. The Drokin species is an old species of wise and intelligent reptiles, the ancestors of the majestic dragons. The, el the oldest and strongest Drokin is Sophic, who wields an overwhelming arcane power. So, types are Dragon, Drokin, and, Yar and Yargath. Power 4, Finesse 6, Vitality 7, Mentality 9, Judgment 8, and Charisma 7. You can see why she doesn't need the plus 1. Mm -hmm. As medium armor, 225 HP, 6 movement. One attack, the Basilisk Staff, which has a range of 5 or 10 and deals 5d6 plus 10. Oh. Arcant Arcanting 7, Flight 5, Intuition 6, Observation 5. And, ha and has, a f has a few very interesting abilities. Dragon Arcanica. Suffolk uses Mentality to cast and knows all arcane fire and water spells. Does this include the ones that are, are uh, exclusive to, to... I think it's the Thaumat? Tech. Yeah, that might need some clarification because then again, then again, at twentieth level, this elder, this elder Drokin, knowing superlative spells, wouldn't be too much of a stretch. Well, well, not only superlative spells, but just the things that are, uh, you know, unique, the unique spells of the, of the arcane tree, which are usually just kept for the, uh, for the class they're in. First among dragons, this spell has a hard difficulty. On success, summon five dragons to fly over the battlefield. They deal a combined 8d6 plus 20 arcane, order, presence, reflection, and shadow damage. All adversaries must perform a contested mentality check. On a failure, they take an additional 5d6 arcane damage as the magical fumes mix together around them. May only be successfully cast twice per short rest. Okay? Okay! Oh. He uh, okay! <laughs> then, Here Be Dragons, Sophie carries with her the original copy of the Here Be Dragons tome. All PC Arcanters within eight squares of her may reroll one failed Arcanting roll every three rounds. The Contractor may also cast a free spell once per day while she is active. What is a free spell? I need that definition. I do. 
Yeah. And with great haste. While Suffolk is active, all PCs gain a flight speed of 10 squares. What does this do to people who already have flight speed? Do they get an additional 10 squares? I'd like to think so. That's... <laughs> what? Jesus Christ. The... Brain. <laughs> Brain, please. Um, and let's not forget when it comes to that ridiculous damage for First Among Dragons... Yeah, 8d6 plus 20 of five different types of damage. And then an additional 5d6 if they fail the contested mentality check. And let's not forget Pledge of Destruction. <laughs> attacks, monk, not spells. This isn't a spell yeah. attack, which would, you know, be what you, you, you actually make a direct attack with the spell. This Fair. is just a spell that does a thing. Fair point. <laughs> Even so, even so, 5d6 plus 10 plus 20% more is ridiculous. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that could do it with the Basilisk staff. Yeah. Um, I would like to note one thing, Monk. First Among Dragons does not list an area. It just says all adversaries. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the fuck you button. This is worse than any of the superlatives we've we've seen, even though those superlatives have, you know, ranges of miles or kilometers on them. Um, because if the battlefield is somehow, in some fashion, determined to be a mile by a mile square, and she casts this, it hits every adversary in that mile by mile square. You're fighting a war? First among dragons, bitches! <laughs> then, the Fate Weaver. Our, fi our final um, subclass for the Naturalist. Naturalists have a deep bond with the Strands of Destiny and the Arcane Current. Occasionally, this connection will go stronger and meld with the energy of Miala, Aspect of Destiny. Fate Weavers manipulate the strands that flow between all individuals. Now we're not just life and death, bitches. So, Fate Vision. You can see the Fate strands that link everything. This powerful vision is costly. You are permanently under the blind condition. However, your connection to the Weave grants you the unique expertise Super Sensory. Twice per long rest, you may use Future Sight to see into the future. What you see is up to both the GM and what you request. Though you are considered blind, your negatives are only one auto miss die and minus one bonus die. I can see the future. You also gain the threads of ever change. You gain the ability to manipulate the fate strands. Roll one d six plus five every long rest. These become your fate points. You may spend fate points on the abilities listed below. Rend reality one point. Choose an adversary and perform a contested judgment or canting check. On the success, you shatter their fate lines for a moment. This inflicts judgment in damage to the target, and they roll with an auto miss die on their two next checks. Oh, jeez. At two points, you can use Reveal Destiny. Choose a willing ally and reveal their destiny. That ally rolls with an auto hit die on their next two checks. At two, for two points, you can also do Foreseen Misfortune. Choose an object or being within 15 squares of you and manipulate their luck. If used on a being with a mentality above 4, you must perform a contested or canting check with plus 1 auto hit die. On a success, you cause bad fortune to meet that item or individual. This could be anything from the object shattering or cracking to an adversary tripping on their next movement. You describe what you want to happen, and the GM will decide if this bad fortune could happen. You will be cursed. It sounds to me like that's an excuse to give the GM more dickery powers. <laughs> At one point, you can use Fatal... Sorry, not Fatal. Fateful Reunion. Choose a target and perform a contested Arcanting Mentality check. On a success, that target views you as a close friend or non-threatening individual. This effect lasts for 15 minutes or until you attack the individual. It's Charm Person. Mm -hmm. Charm Person Dating Service. 
<laughs> Not to be confused with Hold Person Wedding Chapel and Remove Curse Divorce Attorney. <laughs> and for fi for five points, you you can you, you can use Prophetic Sight. You may extend you may spend five fate points to use Future Sight once more per day. Before we move on, I would like to actually read out the description of Super Sensory within the expertise section. Go ahead. So Super Sensory is unique, meaning it's going to be different from person to person. You are a being of Super Sensory abilities. Work closely with your GM to create some simple but special Super Sensory strength. Example, ability to sense those with Super Sensory gifts in a small range. Ability to see slightly into the future. Telepathy, etc., you know what my super sensory would be if I was going to take this uh, this particular um, specialization, Monk? What? Echolocation. Are you a lawyer from Hell's Kitchen? <laughs> no. I don't wield a staff that turns into other things either. Nor do I dress in red. Red looks terrible on me. Anyway, at level 10, you gain Forewarned Danger. Your passive observation is plus one difficulty higher. You also gain Fateful Escape. Once per 24-hour period, when you take lethal damage, you may bend the strands of fate and tear a portal into Adareth and teleport through it. This removes you from combat until the start of your next turn. You heal 25 HP on return. Because Adreth is the realm of life, so... Swamp... Oh, healing rays back. You're, 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 you're nightcrawlering in place to heal yourself. Yep. Hey. At level, at level 15, you gain Bound by Fate... You are bound by fate to your allies and summons. You may spend one fate point when another ally takes damage to absorb half the damage taken. This effect may be used once per round. You also gain greater connection. You may roll your fate points every short rest instead of every long one. And lastly, you gain Voice of Destiny. Gain plus one bonus level in dodge and gain an auto-hit when attempting to deflect. Once every 24 hours, you may warp the strands of destiny. When you do this, you allow either one check of an ally to automatically succeed in a critical way, or one check of an adversary to automatically fail in a critical way. You can either force a crit, a crit, ro a crit success or a crit bungle. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not busted at all imagine uh, forcing a, somebody casting a superlative spell to crit bungle and then running the hell away <laughs> that's what i do mm -hmm. i'm a dick enough to do it um i were playing the fate weaver yeah i'm a dick enough to do it <laughs> now side note we are getting to the spell list and if you remember we have mentioned that natura spells can only be cast by naturalists this is a tree that cannot be taken by any other class mm -hmm. not a single spell can be borrowed yep so let's see uh, we start so we start off <clears throat> with the novice spells and the first one we have is bestial rage which is an Arcanting Attack, has a range of 15 squares, instant duration, two-round cooldown. And as an as a... You can transform yourself physically for one round as an extra attack. If in melee, you transform into a Flame Drake. And if you succeed, inflict weapon damage plus 1, 2, 3, or 4d6 fire damage and inflict burning. If at range, you transform into a Great Nachala. On a hit, inflict weapon damage plus 1, 2, 3, 4, d6 nature damage, and inflict poison. Why does this sound like a... Why, why, why does this sound like a... What's the word I'm looking for, Monk? You're, you're, shape, you're shape shifting. Why does it sound like that? 
<laughs> Wouldn't be the first time tonight. True. Then we have Call Forth the Arklet. Arklets are small, arcane, and fused creatures that, inhis that inhibit the misty force of, of Adareth. Let's see. It's an easy difficulty. Range self, duration instant, two hours. Cooldown, one hour. This creature flies around you while summoned, gained one successful die to, on your arcanting checks. You may target an adversary and perform a contested arcanting check. On a success, the arclet flies to the target and they roll with minus two bonus dice on their contested checks against your spells. Hey, it's fairy fire, except it's actually useful. It, not only is it fairy fire it, it and useful, it's a... Uh... Is basically you're sending a little thing over there to act as a fucking dowsing rod for your own magic. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next we have Call the Elements. The realms of Arcane and Adareth work in harmony. Average difficulty ranges self seven by seven. Duration instant, cooldown three rounds. Call the Wrath of Nature and the Fury of the Arcane. You slam your weapon into the ground and summon a swarm of elements to attack. All beings, excluding yourself, within the field must perform a hard balance check. On a failure, they take 3, 4, 5, or 66 judgment elemental damage. On a success, they take half damage. So basically, don't do this around your friends. Mm -hmm. However, uh, teleporting into a group using the, the uh, tree walker feature you get, the one that allows you to travel the routes... Um, that would be a useful way to, uh, to do it. Oh, yes. So then we have Forest's Wrath. The spirits of the forest can be a vengeful lot when summoned. Hard difficulty, range is 10 squares, 5 by 5. Duration, channel 1, 3 rounds. Cooldown is 2 rounds. Choose a square within range and sing the song of the forests. Your chant raises a forest in a 5x5 five five area field. All adversaries within the forest immediately take 1, 2, 4, or 76 plus judgment in nature damage. Whether natura or arcane spells are successfully cast near this forest, the life essence within will lash out at all adversaries within 4 squares of the forest. They inflict 1, 2, 3, or 5d6 nature damage on successful hits and use your arcanting skill when attacking. Wait, wait a minute. First of all, you raise a 5x5 five five forest. But then, whenever you cast Natura or Arcane spells in the presence of the forest, it lashes out four squares outside of itself as well? Mm-hmm. Okay! okay. Let's see, then we have Life's Gift. Sounds like healing. Let's see, average difficulty, five square range, duration instant, five rounds... Cooldown once per person per day. Cast the spell and plant a life-giving seed within an ally. If they are reduced to 0 HP, the seed covers them, healing them for 8, 12, 18, or 25 HP. The spell stays on an ally for 5 rounds and cannot be cancelled. It may be used on one ally at a time and cast on the same target once per day. It's auto-life. It's life. Yeah, I was about to say, it's life 3. Mm -hmm. And we have Planted Trap. The forests of the world are filled with dangerous traps. Difficulty average, range 2 squares in a 5x5 five, five five area. Duration instant, 4 rounds. Cooldown, 3 rounds. Choose an area and plant a shrapnel seed in the ground. Once an adversary steps into the 5x5 five five area, it explodes. The adversary performs a hard, balanced dodge check. On a failure, they are inflicted with 1, 2, 4, or 6 d6 plus 10 piercing damage and are grasped by vines for 2 rounds. On a success, they take half damage and resist the grasped condition. My name is the Lorax. I speak for the trees. Let's not talk here. They speak Vietnamese. <laughs> Next is Rejuvenation. Easy difficulty, range self, 11 by 11. Duration instant, cooldown 3 rounds. Open a small rift into Adareth, calling forth the spores of the Ameliofe plant. Sorry if I mispronounced that.
These spores attach to all PCs within the 11 by 11 area field and heal for 10, 15, 25, or 45 HP. It's mass cure light wounds. Indubitably. Then we have summon beastling. Div difficulty none, range 15 squares, duration instant, 2 hours, cooldown 10 minutes. Summon a small beast that cannot attack. This small beast can be anything small, such as a bird, a cat, a rat, a wolf pup, etc. This animal acts like a real animal and can perform their simple actions. As an extra action, you can see through the animal's eyes and hear through their ears. Why am I reminded of the sommelier and his, and his raven? Both the raven never more, monk. <laughs> but this is basically just a second spirit animal. Yep. See, then we have, and last of the last of the base level, we have Vine Lash, not to be confused with Rose Whip Lash, or Vine Whip. Mm -hmm. It's an arcanting attack. Range is twelve squares. Duration is instant. Cooldown is three rounds. Lash a vine out towards an adversary, attempting to latch to them. On success, the vine latches to the target, inflicting. 10, 15, 25, or 45 natural damage. You may pull the adversary closer towards you or push them away by 4, 5, 6, or 7 squares. Mm -hmm. Pull or push. Interesting. Yeah. Bring them closer to me. I want to cut them with my scythe, monk. And that's it for the novice spells. Then we have Apprentice. First one is Latching Grenade. Infuse the power of the forest into a grenade. My name is the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I don't like these ones. They speak Vietnamese. Difficulty average. Range thrown, so three times power. So it's going to be really good for death archetypes. <laughs> Duration instant, cooldown three rounds. After this grenade explodes, tendrils of vines lash out at all adversaries within its area field, inflicting your judgment in additional natura damage. The hit adversaries must perform a contested or canting, balance, or muscle check. If they fail, they are pulled to the center of the grenade's impact zone. If they run into other adversaries, each takes an additional 3, 4, or 66 bludgeoning damage. So it explodes and then implodes, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's not too far removed from a black hole grenade. Mm -hmm. So next we have Naturium Runes, the armor of... Difficulty is average 3, range is touch, duration is instant, 4 rounds, cooldown is 2 rounds. Touch the armor of an ally, enchanting it with the runes of Adareth. Whenever an adversary attempts to hit the enchanted ally, they roll with 1, 1, or 2 auto-miss dice. Jesus. See, next we have Overgrowth. Hard difficulty, range is 10 squares, duration is instant, 20 minutes. Cooldown is 20, 15, or 10 minutes. Choose a being with the keyword Beast, Treekin, Topkin, or Elyon and double their height. They inflict an additional 1d6 on attacks and have an additional 1, 1, or 2 squares of reach. However, they're easier to hit. Attackers gain 2, 1, or 0 auto hit dice against them. <laughs> Imagine using this on the on the summoned tree that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. The summoned tree from your words? From yep. your from your Except that's only a one turn thing. Because mm -hmm. that tree just summons for an attack and then either disappears or blows up or just blows up. See, next we have Season of Power. A difficulty hard, range self, and 10 squares. Duration instant, cooldown 4 rounds. Upon casting, choose which season to summon. Spring, 
Heal an ally for 2, 3, or 4d6 HP. Summer, give 2 allies plus 2, 4, or 6 HP squares of extra movement and 2 squares of jump height. Autumn, summon an Autumn Treekin that has 5 HP and performs simple actions for 1 minute. Or Winter, choose a 5x5 five five area field. All beings in that field are grasped by ice for 2 rounds. Huh. Thematically appropriate. It absolutely is. So next we have Thorn Strike Armor. Difficulty is average three, range is touch, duration is instant, one minute. Cooldown is five rounds. Choose an ally. Whenever the enchanted ally is successfully hit, sharp thorns strike at the attacker and inflict three, four, or five D6 piercing damage. This spell lasts for one minute or two, three, or four attacks, whichever happens first. Cast it on your tank. Yep. Then we have a, then that's the that's the last of the apprentice level spells. Then we we move on to adept level, starting with Adareth's flood. The skies rip open as the fury of the of the Adareth realm floods ours. Difficulty hard. Range is fifteen square fi is within fifteen squares of an area of seven by seven or nine by nine. Duration is channel one, three rounds. Cooldown is six rounds. Choose an area within range and a realm tear appears over a seven by seven or nine by nine area field. All beings within that field take either seven or nine D six plus ten natura damage. They may perform a hard or t Hard or tough dodge check to take half damage. On subsequent turns, you may channel this spell, inflicting 3 or 4d6 natural damage to all beings within the field. Now, I don't think that this would work the same way the Reflection Realm thing did, because I don't think that the Naturalist could stand in this field without taking damage. Mm hmm. But I imagine that if they could, without taking damage, this is a place where they wouldn't build up Natra Charge. And all of a sudden, all the enemies are asking, "Why is that? Why is that guy? Why is that guy to have an umbrella in here?" <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So it's, so it isn't a case of just a little bit of rain. It's a, it's akin to dumping a bucket of water on their heads. Mm. A bucket of life energy. You're giving them cancer. <laughs> nope, I've got... Fuck! Monk, god damn it! What? The naturalist is tied to life and death. It's colored green. And it can kill people by overcharging them with life. The naturalist is a getter. <laughs> <laughs> the naturalist is a motherfucking getter and i will not hear anyone tell me otherwise mm -hmm. so then we have archaic understanding no difficulty range is self duration is instant two hours cooldown is 30 minutes after you cast the spell, you can read all non-unique languages for two hours. At Magus level, you can speak all unique languages as well. While you know the spell, and ca you can passively see, read, and write runescript. Huh. So, Tongue of Sun and Moon. Except better. Mm -hmm. And we have Become the Wild. Difficulty is average three. Range is self, duration is instant, four or eight hours, cooldown is two hours. Transform yourself into an average treekin or beast creature. At Magus level, you transform into a strong beast or treekin. Add two or three times vitality to your HP and five or f 15 damage to attacks. During the duration, you may freely che change between your forms as an action. There's your wild shape. Yep, wi wild shape. And given the, and um, imagine combining the, imagine combining become the wild, with 
overgrowth. Stop. <laughs> so you turn into a bear, and then you double the height of that bear. Or we do something to annoy you, turn into an ent, and double the height of that ent. Fucking ents. <laughs> Especially since un it it doesn't say it doesn't say that when you transform yourself you can't cast. Mm-hmm. You can freely change between your forms, probably because being a giant fucking tree might cause some social repercussions. Yep. Um. Mm. And then, then we before get to... we go on, monk. Go ahead. I I I realized that I forgot to do uh, our total at the end of the normal features. Fair point. So uh, at twentieth level, I... how many spells would you have? Well, remember that at fifteenth level we had seventeen. Mm -hmm. So at 16th, we get another one. That's 18. At 18th, we get another one. That's 19. And you don't get another additional spell at uh, 20. You just get access to superlative. So you get to choose 19 Natura spells. Mm -hmm. Well, 19 spells in general, you could make them all Natura if you want. Yeah. <laughs> then we get to the Magus spe spells. First is Avatar of Draca. You take on an avatar form of the Celestial Dragon Lord Draca. Difficulty easy to easy. Range self. Duration instant. 30 minutes. Cooldown 2 hours. Transform into a Celestial Dragon form with a base size of 5 by 7. You may transform yourself between your normal form and this form as an extra action while the spell is active. While in the dragon form, you gain the following bonuses. Plus one to power and vitality. A walk of 12 squares and a flight of 20 squares. As, and Starfire. As an attack, lob a concentrated glob of solar energy at a 5x5 five five AoE up to 25 squares away. In space, the range is 20 squares and 3x3 three three AoE. This attack inflicts twice the weapon's damage. You also gain Soul Claws. Perform an attack. On a success, the attack inflicts two times weapons damage and burning. And Avatar of the Stars. You are immune to the effects of Space slash the Void while in this form. So if you get spaced through the airlock, you have time to get back. Mm -hmm. Not only time to get back, but also, t also time to fuck up whoever spaced you. Mm-hmm. It'd be fun to it'd be fun to use this kind of thing in um ship to ship combat. Use it to fly over and infiltrate. Yeah, have somebody open the airlock, jump out, cast it, cast this, and that, and then f and then fuck up the fleet. I would cast this just before jumping out, and then switch while you're in in the void. Mm -hmm. So then we have Eloa's gift of rebirth. Difficulty is tough. Range touch. Duration 10 minute channel. Cooldown 1 hour. Once per game, per player, you call upon the divine grace of Eloa to revive those whose soul has faded. This soul can only revive someone who has been dead for no more than 7 hours. Well, mm -hmm. there's our raised dead, just with a whole lot less some um, diamonds. Question. With the whole... Uh, stasis spell from the ethers that that preserves a body can it go for longer than seven hours? That's a, that's a good clarification to know. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have shifting light. The first words of the Adareth realm still have great power. Difficulty is average, range is 3 miles by 3 miles, duration is channel 1, 15 minutes, cooldown is 30 minutes. Directly distort the light or lack of light in the specified area, turning an area of dark light or night into bright light, day, or vice versa. This works while aboard a ship or in space. 
However, the area field is 100 by 100. Nothing except for the same spell or a legendary artifact may negate or affect this light. If something would negate the spell, perform a contested or canting check against it. On success, you prevent, you prevent the negation. Magical darkness, except it's three miles by three miles. Mm-hmm. Um, you want... Or magical light. You want to know what would be the ultimate dick move? Going into it, going in, getting into a fight with a with a vampire and then casting this. The question is, does it actually produce the light of day or just change the light? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. Or, or if not that, um, fight, go up when going up against somebody who's light sensitive. Mm -hmm. Or. If you really want to be a dick, remember remember the advantages you have while in shadows. <laughs> and what it what is night but one giant shadow? Exactly. And then we get to the superlative spells. You may only cast two of your superlative spells a day, and each spell may only be cast once per day. All superlative spells have a challenging six difficulty and are unaffected by the charge state. So first we have Breath of Tevarath. Request the assistance of the Prime Dragon of Adareth. Range is a 30 square cone. Duration is instant. You may choose two beings within the cone's area field. Those two beings are healed for five times judgment in HP. All other beings within that field instantly take 60 Natura damage and are inflicted with the burning condition. Nah, really? I can't imagine why the why the breath of a dragon would set them on fire. Mm -hmm. oh. And we have Summon the Defender. Request the assistance of the Guardians of the Gate to Adareth. Range adjacent, duration instant, 2 minutes. Summon a Melon Defender to your side. It follows your commands and will protect you to its last breath. Shit. Melon Defender. Type is Adareth, Mecha, Treekin, Challenging. <laughs> Treekin, Mecha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Power 11, Finesse 8, Finesse 8, Vitality 9, Mentality 6, Judgment 5, Charisma 4. Has Tough Armor, 2,900 hit points. And 10 movement. Has 3 attacks. Gatling Trunk. <laughs> Range 19 to 30. Deals 5d6 plus 10 piercing. And Trunk Slam. Which deals 3d6 plus 15 force. Has Covert 2, Defense 3, Dual Wield 7, Hunting 3, Observation 5, and Weapons 4. Why does it have Covert? <laughs> That is a good question. Let's see. And its abilities are Defender of Ad of Adareth. While defending other Adareth, Treekin, or Beast creatures, the Defender's armor cannot be reduced. Which includes you, I believe, as a naturalist. Mm -hmm. Drink deep. Upon taking water damage, negate the damage and heal 20% max HP. And Flammable... Mm -hmm. Immunity to natural damage, but weakness to fire. I mean, it is a tree. And poisoned shots. All Gatling attacks inflict the poison condition. That's a double fuck you, considering what it, it's got a range of 19 to 30 squares and does 5d6 plus 10 piercing. You want to know what... Well, you want to know what I keep thinking of? A tree version of heavy arms. Yeah, I can see you imagining that. <laughs> Just three attacks with a Gatling trunk. There's some Bert if I ever heard it. Yeah, I was just think I was just thinking an A10 warthog with legs that was made of uh, trees. Are you implying that a that heavy arms is not a A10 warthog with legs? He's too slow, and he doesn't fly enough. No, that's because Troa does it. But then next we have Tempest of Emilio Fey. 
Strike a rune into the void, tearing a pathway into Adareth. Range is 17 by 17. Duration is channel 2, 3 rounds. Unleash a swirling storm of healing and destruction. Choose three beings other than yourself and heal them for half their max HP. All other beings within the radius, excluding yourself, take 50 natura damage. Every round af after it's channeled, heal the three beings by 15 HP and inflict an additional 15 damage to the others. Of course. And, um... I think so... I think so... Combining that with some of the other abilities we've seen here would is going to be interesting. So, next is Vengeance of the Mother Tree. Tear into the veil, ripping into the realm roots of the Mother Tree. Range is 30 squares, 17 by 17. Duration channel 2, 3 rounds. Deal 55 damage to every being within the field. You may choose up to 3 beings within 5 squares of the field's edge who must perform a challenging 6 dodge check. On a failure, they teleport into the center of the vine field and take 80 damage instantly. This procs any time a creature enters the field or attempts to exit. Huh. Huh. Oh, oh, okay. So they attempt to run out of the field and get within the edge of the field, and then they're thrown back in. Got it. It's a we trap, monk. <laughs> <laughs> now, granted, it's only it's only for three it's only for three rounds, but still, that is that is very much a fuck you button. Although between the super superlative spells. The one that the one that I think we'd get the most use out of, especially with certain combos, would be the would be summon the defender. Yeah. Especially given given our given um th given things like pledge of destruction if we're going with a naturalist contractor. <laughs> oh wait, never mind, that's um con that's with contracted summons only, so it wouldn't count. Yeah. But even even with even with even with that um there's st there's still there's still some interesting combinations you can do with superlatives even though um superlatives you aren't going to be com aren't going to be all that compatible with a lot of um class and subclass features. And I think that's the point because they're fuck because they're supposed to be a um a potential nuke. Yeah, it's the fuck you button. Mm -hmm. Fuck you, fuck everyone you knew, fuck everyone that you didn't know. It's the fuck you button. Yep. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I'll be fucking you later. <laughs> fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, and especially fuck you. Mm-hmm. So, the as if we haven't used the f bomb enough. You're, back when we were doing the Valley of the Judge on Heavens and Heresies, there were moments where we had a where you were exclaiming "What the fuck!" with every class. Yes, we haven't had we haven't had that for Veil of the Voids classes until now. Most of it's yeah. most of the time it's been a very not very nice design kind of thing, but never a WTF. Then the naturalist came in. Now I do want to make one thing clear. I don't think the naturalist is at the same level of ridiculousness that third edition druids were. I don't think it's at any of the levels of ridiculousness that you would expect from the broken stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of that is due to how due to the particularities of how magic works in Veil of the Void. Other aspects are due to the fact that um even I'd say even at high levels, a naturalist is not a do everything character. Yeah, no, the naturalist has a very clear role it's going to have to choose. 
It has paths it can take, kind of like with 13th Age. Mm -hmm. And it can probably take one path really well and one path sort of well, or it can take one path super, super well, or it could try to take some of the other paths all okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the, basically the same way that we saw with, uh, that we saw with, um, with the way the, the initiate adept pathing works in 13th age. Um, mm -hmm. It was pretty, it's still, it's still, there's still some, there's a lot of, uh, clarification. Yeah, there's, we, we, I think this is the chapter where we've asked for the most clarifications. If only because there's certain things that we've seen in this class that I could very easily see going a bit ridiculous. Especially if they're rules lawyered and abused to hell. Mm -hmm. Or, or if you have somebody who who um who is looking for new and interesting ways to break your stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are that person. I mean, the best way to fight the Munchkin is to become the Munchkin. True. This is not this is not a time where Nietzsche's uh, statements apply. You absolutely want to become the monsters you fight here, just to understand their weapons better. Yeah, so then you can beat them at their own game. Yes. And if you need if you need a case in point with that, um, <laughs> Zan, did I ever tell you about the time that that I that I um. That I I managed to con I managed to con the door to door Girl Scouts. <laughs> uh huh. Um, cause they would they would all they would offer they would br they would do the sales pitch with the cookies, um, but they'd always open up with things like the thin mints, and then I'd bring then I'd bring up that I can't that I can't have it because I can't have chocolate, and they and. They would get so, they would get so oh they would get so embarrassed about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then I end up getting a free a freebie of the lemon ones. I think I did that like three times because like because I was moving to different spots and it just it just happened that way. It just worked. It just worked. <laughs> and hey, don't hate the player, hate the game. Ah <laughs> uh, yes. But I'd say I'd say the it, given given the way these spells have been looking, it, it could be easy to say, especially with the naturalist, uh, that spell casting is going to outshine the marshals. Not still, that is not. I don't think that's the case for a couple of reasons. One, there's some ridiculousness that that the that the straight that the straight up of that the straight-up martial classes can do, especially the field knight. Mm-hmm. What with his whole... I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge at you, and I'm gonna take all your friends... I'm gonna charge at you, make you take wall damage, and bring all your friends with me. Yep. But... Th but let's not... Let's also not forget that... Unlike some of the more popular fantasy entries, it is very easy to be a gish in this game. Yeah, all you got to do is take a level in our canting, mm -hmm. <laughs> which means that you, which means that you could be a decent gish right out of the fucking gate. Yep. Now, granted, will you be able to be a gish and get all and get the really crazy stuff? Not quite. But you'll be able to get some. You'll be able to do some decent amounts of gishiness. Now. When it comes to the naturalist, um, there are you. They can they can certainly do a fair. They can certainly do a fair amount of of da of damage or healing or both. But I th I'd say that they have. I'd say that their choices mean they have to go whether or not they're going to be doing damage, whether they're going to be doing healing, um, or su or summoning, as they as they love as they level up. They'll mm -hmm. have they'll certainly have a mix, but 
much like I'd say much like the Macromancer, they're n they're not exactly precise. Which is why taking ether spells is also a perfect idea. Mm -hmm. Naturalist, I think it's more the fact that naturalist spells are not going to be subtle. At all. But I mean, they're... ripping ripping through the void to uh, to pull life energy, just like ripping through the void to pull death energy is not going to be... Is not going to be uh, subtle. So this is the first time in a while we've seen some hinting of a build being able to do pure damage. Well, there's pure damage in a few other places. Oh yeah, there. Is... there was... I think there. I think there were. When it came to when it came to classes, not as much. I think there were a few instances when it came to races. Mm, I'll have to take a look again. I'm pretty sure there was more pure damage elsewhere. Oh. Let me... Let me, let me double check here. Um, there was the... Okay, there's that, but... Um, Celestia's ha Celestia's have th had it, but that was a species thing. There was also the whole blood of the martyr thi martyr thing. Yeah, uh, I. Um, Artificer's blast had pure damage at the yep. st at the start. Yeah. Um meta weapons had meta weapons had pure damage for combat medics. Mhm. Mm there was the whole thing of malpractice is sometimes called for. <laughs> um adrenaline boosters for the conscientious objector. Yep. And um a bit of a bit of it for sawbones. So okay, okay I do take it back. There's a fair I'd say there's probably one pure damage build for every archetype. For every mm -hmm. class, I should say. Um, the now, as far as what we've got, as far as what we've got next week, let's see here, because because not only do I have to see what we've got next week, but I also have to see what sort of bad jokes I can pull off next week. Next week. We're actually not covering a casting class for once. Yeah, we did three casting classes in a row. Now we'll be moving back to some non-casters. Nope. We are dealing with the equivalent to the Diplomancer in the Negotiator. So, cast in the name of God, ye not guilty. How did I know that you were going to make that joke? Because if I didn't, you would have. This is true. Stealing my thunder, how dare you. Oh, you gotta be quicker than that. Are you saying you can run faster than me because you're black? Fuck off. <laughs> okay, you say bolt. <laughs> I can certainly swim faster than you have I hated track and field. I love swimming. Yep. But um, that, but we'll, but like I said, we'll be covering the negotiator next week. It'll so that'll be a good opportunity to talk about the concept of the diplomancer and its value, as well as well as the um, unfortunate things that have sprouted up from the diplomancer archetype. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about bards. Oh boy! But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>